Hi, my name is Dr. Alyssa Reingold. I'm a clinical psychologist and professor at the Medical University of South Carolina, as well as the director of the Preparedness and Response Division of the National Mass Violence Victimization and Resource Center. I'm here today to talk to you about mindfulness and strategies to manage work and life stressors. So let's talk a little bit about kind of what mindfulness is. Uh, mindfulness often, I think, has gotten, it's kind of the buzzword people are hearing in the past decade, and it's sort of kind of been on the rise as far as practice. Um, but often people don't really kind of understand kind of the core concepts of mindfulness. And we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about mindfulness. But before we do, I want to first talk a little bit about the opposite of mindfulness mindlessness. So mindlessness is sort of our inactive state of our mind that's characterized by the reliance on distinctions. It's characterized by our past, where our past overdetermines our present. We are often trapped in a single perspective. We're not really paying attention to context. We're rule governed. We're sort of just kind of going on autopilot is really what mindlessness is. So how many of you have driven home from work um, or forever to, and just driven home on autopilot and kind of don't remember any of that drive home, right? Um, your mind was somewhere else. I bet though you didn't run any red lights, your body and part of your mind was on autopilot. Um, and so that is the, the complete opposite of mindfulness. So mindfulness is a state of being fully aware of your given present moment. It's being awake. So uh, we see mindfulness in the writings of Thoreau and in Whitman. Um, and um, it, you know, it, it's, it's truly about being here in the present moment. It doesn't have to be spiritual. There's no religion tied to it. It's just learning how to, when we are being able to be present, we're really, we're, we're living. We're not, we're not taking for granted each and every moment of our lives. And our lives are fuller for that. Few of us ever live in the present. We are often either um, anticipating the future, thinking about planning for the future, or we're uh, remembering and thinking about the past. And we're not here in the present moment. Now we do have to, at times in our life, um, think about the past because it helps us plan, right? And, and work things out. And we do have to plan for the future. Um, but if we're always in both those states, we're missing out on the here and now. And really that's what mindfulness is about. So often we can be, our mind can be full, right? Of lots of things. Um, and we're full of all sorts of things. We're, we're missing out on being mindful in the moment, in the here. So mindfulness can often quiet our mind some when, we're, can, when we can learn how to be present. This is just a quote from Kung Fu Panda, I think three, uh, that my daughter pointed out to me um, that they said, yesterday is history, tomorrow is a mystery, but today is a gift. And that's why we call it present. Right, it's learning how to be here. So the goal is really, um, it's a, you know, it's it's a training that can change our relationship when we're here in the moment. It can change our relationship with our emotions, so they're not necessarily uh, constituents of ourself, but more rather they're something we notice and they appear to us. They're phenomenon that comes and goes that they are not us, our emotions and our thoughts. And mindfulness training can actually help, help kind of distance us from those experiences and then we can better manage them. <clears throat> so mindfulness, as I mentioned, is, is paying attention in a particular way on purpose in the present moment, non-judgmentally. That's the tricky part because as humans, we tend to judge, we're kind of judgy. Um, and it's learning how to, to be present, uh, which is also a struggle because our mind wants to go other places. So it's how to be focused in the present with purpose without judgment. So I could look at the sunset and watch the sunset and be present with that. 
and describe the colors and, you know, notice um, the images and just be one notice and describe in my head. But when I start saying, oh, it's beautiful, I'm really liking this, that starts to get into judgment. And so mindfulness is trying not to go down that path, but just be with whatever comes your way. So um, let's do a little bit of practice to kind of demonstrate just there's lots of different approaches to mindfulness. So if you're willing, like you just take a moment just to, um, if you're willing to close your eyes, and just take a moment and I want you just to start to think about your feet. That's right, your feet. So just start to tend to and pay attention to your feet. Think about maybe how your feet carried you, the distance today, maybe where they've taken you. Are they flat on the ground, maybe compare one foot to the other. Maybe notice judgments or evaluations that pop into your head because they will. Do you have any worries about your feet? Any future oriented thoughts? Oh, maybe I'd like to schedule a pedicure. So just take a minute just to continue to think about your feet and just let anything come to mind. Now I'd like you to sort of stop that direct attention and shift. We're still gonna focus on our feet, but now pay attention to your feet by just being aware of the sensations of your feet in your shoes, maybe pressing against the floor. Notice the sensation between your toes moisture, heat, if any, any throbbing or pain, just let any sensation come and just notice them. I'd like you to stop the, your directed attention to your feet and just um, take pause for a moment and notice these are two different ways of experiencing your feet. First, kind of we're focusing on our thoughts around our feet and then our sensations. Both of those, mindfulness incorporates all of that. We can be mindful with our thoughts and our emotions. We can be mindful with our sensations. It's taking all that in account. But what did you notice? Was it hard to focus on your feet? For some people, it's a challenge to keep our mind focused and that's okay. Some people were surprised. Maybe they noticed sensations were heightened. They noticed more throbbing than they, that was there. They noticed their feet were cold and they didn't notice that before. We didn't change your experience. We just became more aware of it. And that's what mindfulness, the more you practice that, the more you become aware of your experiences. Now, what about experiences maybe we may not like that are difficult or challenging? Well, mindfulness tries to allow us to sit with that also. So it's not about choosing, I'm going to be mindful when I go on vacation with this sunset, right? Um, but I don't want to deal with that. Mindfulness is taking into account everything and trying to be present and aware of it all. And the more we can do that, the more we appreciate and tend to and experiencing more joy because we're tending to it more, but we're also becoming more aware of the other more challenging emotions. And when we do, and when we sit with that, they actually tend to settle. So it can kind of quiet and calm our mind. So 
mindfulness goes hand in hand with this with uh, acceptance. This principle of acceptance is our direct moment to moment content contact with events and taking in experiences for what it is and not what we think it should be. Um, and that, that can be a challenge sometimes. Um, and I'll give you kind of a personal example for me. So I have two daughters. And um, when my daughters were younger, they're teenagers now, but when they were younger, we decided to do a family day. We were going to a local park. We loaded the bikes in and we were going to go bike riding for the day. And it was going to be kind of family time. So we get there. And within like the first 15 minutes, my older daughter is like whining. She's hungry, you know, she's hot. She doesn't really like bugs. It's buggy and she's hot. And, and my younger daughter is whining, complaining that she's hungry. That child's always hungry. She's hungry and she wants to eat. And, you know, um, and my husband was getting frustrated because they're kind of being whining. He's snapping at them. And I was like, guys, you know, like, shush, we're having a moment. We're riding our bikes. We're enjoying the day, right? Um, so I was not accepting that moment for what it was. And if I continued to not accept it for what it was, what would have probably happened is we all probably would have thrown our hands up and my husband would be like, we're just leaving. We're just load the, the, the bikes up and we're going home. But I took pause, had to take a deep breath. We'll talk about breathing in a minute, but took a deep breath, ground myself and th thought to myself, okay, this, I have to accept this for what it is. Um, and not what I think it should be or what I want it to be in order to do something different. So acceptance, acceptance allows us to create space to kind of create more room for alternatives. So what was my goal today? Well, my goal was, was part of the value of having family time. All right. So what can we do then um, with intention towards that? Well, at this park, there was a new climbing wall area, which we had never been to. So I said, why don't we just go there? Well, it was in the shade. So my older daughter was happy because it wasn't as hot. And they had a snack bar there. So my younger daughter got her snack. And then we just were doing something different. Um, but if I didn't accept the moment earlier for what it was, um, we probably wouldn't have been able to shift and do something different. So acceptance allows us to kind of experience the moment for what it is. Um, it allows us to appreciate feelings such as joy, peacefulness, without going by unacknowledged. So acceptance allows us to acknowledge every moment. But it also uh, doesn't allow us to push away things because they will be there um, the more we push them away. Also doesn't mean just resigning, though, to them. If there are difficult emotions or experiences, it doesn't mean we throw our, our hands up. It just means we're acknowledging what's happening right now is happening. So acceptance doesn't tell us what to do with it. What we choose to do with that just comes from sort of understanding that moment a little bit more fully, and not just reacting to it, okay? I want to talk just real briefly about something that often people uh, um, do when they have negative emotions or difficult emotions. Experience, experiential avoidance is the process of trying to avoid our own experiences, whether they're thoughts, feelings, memories, body sensations. Um, we try to avoid it because short term, it, we feel better. We're not experiencing it. But unfortunately, we continue to avoid them it can cause long-term difficulties because they don't go away. So it kind of exacerbates the problem. So if you aren't willing to have it, you will. Um, and we know that from research that experiential avoidance goes hand in hand with a significant number of anxiety difficulties. Um, even mental health disorders like general anxiety disorder and um, panic disorder and um, post-traumatic stress disorder, um, physical pain, people with chronic pain, if they um, ex um, have experiential avoidance, tend to have more heightened pain, heightened pain in their experience. Um, and so it can go hand in hand with some complications in life. So what do we do about that? How, how do we learn to accept whatever's coming our way? Well, willingness is a skill that can help us do that. Willingness is accepting what is together with responding to what is in an effective and appropriate way is what willingness is.
So willingness is not a feeling. It's actually a skill. It's being intentional about acceptance. So it allows us to open uh, to the experience and making a choice to fully experience it um, is what willingness is. So often right about now, if I'm hearing a lecturer talk about some of these concepts, um, I'm a researcher, so this is probably why, but usually I'm like, well, what does this really help? Like, is there really evidence? Is this just kind of like, you know, hocus pocus? And so I usually am the one raising my hand and talk. So let's talk real quickly before we start going into more practice of these skills. I want to just highlight that mindfulness, um, in the past decade, there's been a ton of research on mindfulness, um, and it's been shown to uh, in, be effective in helping overall psychological health stress in medical students and physicians and college students and teens and children and adults and just general overall psychological health. And there's also research to show that it's also helpful in the mental health arena. So um, folks who suffer from depression or anxiety can benefit from mindful-based cognitive behavioral therapy approaches. Even folks suffering from psychosis, it doesn't take away the psychosis, but it helps people learn to cope differently um, with, with those type of mental health adversities. Lots of research when it comes to anxiety and depression. It's also been shown to be helpful amongst medical populations, fibromyalgia, vascular disease, uh, breast cancer patients, again, around the mental health pieces that's associated with those medical issues. So again, mindfulness means paying attention in a particular way on purpose, in the present moment, non-judgmentally, okay? So let's take a moment, we're gonna to practice together. So if you can, if you're able to, hopefully you're not driving, um, if you're willing to close your eyes, and if you don't wanna close your eyes, just focus your attention just to one focal point just so you're not too distracted by the things around you. And we are just going to breathe mindfully. And I'm going to time us. Let me get my stopwatch out on my phone. Because we are just going to do this just for three minutes. Okay. So set my timer. All right. So just want you to take a moment and just focus on your breath. Just notice you're just here in this moment, breathing. Maybe you notice cool air with each inhale, warm air with each exhale. Maybe you notice your chest rising and falling. And our goal is not to change your breath, but maybe you notice your breath changing. Notice your body as you breathe. And maybe your mind wanders and that's okay. You can even say to yourself, ah, there's my mind wandering and gently return to your breath. And you might have to do that several times. Your mind might frequently wander because your mind's going to wander. That's what it does. That's okay. 
no judgment. There's no bad way of doing this. We're just gently focusing on our breath. Our breath grounds us, sustains us, gives us life. Know that you can always be mindful by just focusing and being present with your breath. When you're ready, you can return back to the room you're in. How was that? You notice any changes? All we did was breathe for three minutes. We didn't try to change our breath or do anything different. We were just here breathing. For some people, they notice a sensation of relaxation after practicing. That's not necessarily our goal, actually, but it's a consequence that sometimes comes hand in hand when you practice mindfulness, a sense of quiet. For some, your mind might have gone a mile a minute and it was hard to quiet, and that's okay too. Sometimes it just recur, just requires some gentle practice. We can also be mindful with our thoughts. So we can, by, by allowing ourselves just to, to be and recognize our thoughts and acknowledge them, notice them, we can um, have a different experience with them, sort of distance ourselves. Our thoughts and our emotions are not us. It's something we have and experience. So we can have sort of a diffused uh, relationship with, with them. And when we can do that, we're not fighting them. So, you know, it's like our thoughts and our emotions can be great big waves and mindfulness can allow us to sort of, uh, we can't sort of stop those waves, but we can sort of learn to surf them can learn to float on them instead of constantly trying to struggle or push, try to push them away because that doesn't work. It's learning to sit and let them come and let them go. You can practice mindfulness with eating. It actually helps for some individuals with, um, you know, when they, if they're trying to lose weight. Um, but it heightens our experience. We eat all the time, right? And so how often do you actually sit and pay attention to what you're eating? It enriches and enhances the sensations um, of your foods. Um, so instead of maybe grabbing, you know, 10 Hershey Kisses, if you were just to eat one mindfully, just tasting the food, smelling it first, just letting it sit in your mouth and slowly let that chocolate melt, I'm telling you, it's a different experience. So I encourage you to try that. Um, your next meal, try to sit and notice all the sensations that go with that food um, and see if you can eat mindfully. So you can foster a formal practice. That some people were, are interested in doing where, you know, you know they, they formally practice mindful breathing and mindful eating, engage in nature and do formal nature walk, walking mindfully. Um, you can uh, learn meditation and yoga practices are forms of mindfulness, but you don't have to do meditation or yoga in order to practice mindfulness. I think some people get scared away of mindfulness because they think that's what they have to do. They say, oh, I'm not good at it. Well, firstly, there's no such thing as not good when it comes to these type of practices. But the other thing is you don't have to do that type of formal practice. You can engage it in your everyday life. Um, so you don't have to carve out time. Chores are a golden opportunity to practice mindfulness because uh, we have to do them anyways and we can engage of that experience and truly being in it. There are a number of apps out there that you can use to practice some formal practice of mindfulness if you are interested. So the two most common ones are Headspace 
and calm. I prefer headspace. It's really preferential. You know, everybody's got their own preferences. I like headspace. I like the accents of the, of the speakers. Um, I like that you, that you can do your practice down to three minutes. Um, as low as three minutes. It might even go as low as two minutes, actually. I usually do three minutes uh, just because I'm a little bit more of a that's quick and get to it. Uh, the research that shows actually just three minutes every day is, is uh, can help shift your mood with, with regular practice. So, um, but Headspace goes down to three minutes. I kind of like that. My daughter, I have a teenage daughter, she likes calm. Um, and so, those only go down to 10 minutes, but it's just a different vibe, that app. It's a little bit more of the soothing, calm kind of vibe. Um, and she likes the, they have bedtime stories that kind of are soothing stories that help her quiet her mind to help her fall asleep. So it's just checking out different ones. There's other ones, Simple Habit, Oak, um, Insight Timer. So once you get good at it, and maybe you've done a course at Headspace or Calm, Insight Timer might be the next one to go to. It's free, um, but it's a little overwhelming, I, I'll be honest. Um, there's just a lot of people upload and have have things on Insight, Insight Timer. So different people have all sorts of channels on there. You can check out podcasts and music and poetry and uh, meditation, but it's kind of a, it can be a little overwhelming for the first time uh, mindfulness practice. So, um, but it's something to check out. So other ways to incorporate it in your day-to-day -day life. So I mentioned meditation and yoga you can practice but you can do it in your day-to-day -day life if you don't have time to to practice so uh, mindfulness right is about heightening each every moment so it really shouldn't be just about over here it should be how to how to be in your moment whatever it may be that's really what mindfulness is about so you can do it uh you know listening to music you can when you make your cup of tea or coffee in the morning we often do that on mindlessly on autopilot so the next time you make your coffee or tea in the morning um you know notice the sounds with intention smell your your drink stir your spoon in it take your first sip with intention in that moment just noticing the warm liquid going down. You can practice mindfulness with breathing exercises. So set your, your watch and every day practice just three minutes. You can do it in your day-to-day -day activities. So one recommendation I always tell folks is um, we all have to shower. Hopefully you shower, right? Or bathe in some way. Do that mindfully because often we're in the past or the future when we're bathing because we go on autopilot. And so that's a great opportunity to heighten that experience. Um, smell the shampoo. Notice and describe the water on your back. Feel your what the shampoo feels like when you're rubbing it in your hair. And just be in that moment and see how that changes that, ex that experience. You're not going to solve your life problems in the shower, believe you me. I try, um, but just just take a moment just to be in that shower. Doing your dishes. I actually don't like doing the dishes, but when I do it mindfully, it actually changes my experience with it. Um, it heightens things, and it's it's just it changes my relationship with the doing the dishes. Um, feeling the the sponge on on the plate, rubbing it around. The feel the water on my hands. The smell of the soap. So just kind of uh, walking to your car from, you know, the parking lot or from wherever you are, noticing the things around you um, is really important in your day. We often kind of do this and we're like this all day long, right? Scrolling and it's learning how to put this down and just for a few minutes, just be present with what's around you. So hopefully kind of giving you a little bit of understanding what mindfulness is about, mindfulness practice, um, and it'll spark your interest to learn a little bit more. Um, there's a number of great resources and books out there um, if you're interested. Um, one good one is Wherever You Go, There You Are um, is, a, is a nice starting point um, to, to read a little bit about really brief chapters um, that can help you kind of with some of your practice. So I'm going to end with Winnie the Pooh. What day is it? Asked Pooh. It's today, squeaked Piglet. My favorite day, said Pooh. So I hope uh, that you found today's talk helpful about mindfulness. And, um, and we look forward to seeing you in the rest of our series.